Hello, YouTube isn't. <clears throat> My name is Sabir, Sabir Shah, and uh, I'm from Pakistan. And uh, I have been on YouTube since 2006. You can check on my details. I have 21 subscribers only. And I run a very pathetic kind of uh, uh, channel, YouTube channel about home gardening. That's what my name is also. Uh, my YouTube channel's name is Home Gardening. Um, today, I came here to talk about the unfortunate incident which happened in Pakistan on K2 um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's really saddened for the whole nation of Pakistan that one of our mm, unsung hero, because we had no idea about him, he died in that mm, incident along with uh, a climber from Iceland. John Snorri and uh, one from Chile, Mr. John Pablo. May their souls rest in peace. Um, <clears throat> the reason I'm making this video is very simple. Um, as I said, that I have been a YouTube user for about 14 years now, and um, I don't have any intentions to become famous, or I've never done this before, but so this video is not to get the bait clicks or to get any kind of you know attention i'm not an attention seeker at all uh, i'm just happy with whatever i deliver on my youtube channel which is about home gardening again and uh, i get like on one video i get one view or two views that's all last 14 years so it's not a chance for me to come up with a kind of uh what you call <clears throat> a conspiracy theory about what has happened on K2 <clears throat> and which ended up in the death of uh, three three really famous climbers among the climbers community uh, so I just wanted to clear myself over here that why I'm making this video because it has touched our hearts the way those people, their last days, <clears throat> how they were presented to the media, we love them. I mean, definitely by, by, the, by, by the depth of our hearts. Uh, the How these people were living together and dancing and singing and trying to do the most difficult things of anyone could do in, in the whole life. I have myself been a, an Air Force pilot. I was in Pakistan Air Force from 1994 till 1996. I have flown three aircrafts. Uh, MFI-17, T-37, and Karakram-8, K-8. The name is K-8, like they were trying to get on K-2, so I've been on K-8, the plane, the aircraft. Uh, but for my own reasons, uh, I had to leave the Air Force because of my medical condition, my nose problems. Uh, everyone, all the climbers definitely know the importance of the nose in getting into any heights because for the respiration and lots of stuff and we don't have pressurized cabins like the passenger aircraft so anyhow not talk, gonna talk about myself much so again first thing uh, deepest condolences for people in iceland chile and pakistan and also uh, one bulgarian guy who died on the way coming down from camp three <clears throat> mm, we are shocked we are moved because just like a layman just like a normal person a normal pakistani once we came to know about the news on 5th of february um at around 10 30 p.m <clears throat> pakistani time that uh some of the guys have conquered k2 in winter uh, before that, we also heard about the Nepalese uh, mountaineers. Congratulations to them for achieving one of the biggest, the most difficult tasks among the climbers community. So many heartiest congratulations to them. Uh, but that, that leads to a point that John Pablo, John Snorri, and Ali Satpara who were among the ones who deceased. And still their deaths... Uh, circumstances are unknown um so we felt really proud that people have done that but very next day february 6th 
the, 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 the some depressing news started coming out from the same area so I was just surprised just like the whole nation would have been surprised what has happened what happened there I mean well eventually by the time by the passage of time a few days later the son Sajid Satpara he came down and then he told the story that everything was going fine they were going up and all of a sudden just no news from them so even then by 8th or 9th of February when uh, Sajid Satpara came down to base camp and then he talked about the thing so still we had no no problems but then some stories started coming out and um, there are lots of rumors you know lots of uh, heroic stories and we know that this happens once on these kind of missions especially people you know just add up a lot of things which didn't even happen so i'm not going to talk about the heroic efforts by all these people and whatnot you know so I will just stay to the point I'm trying to which is not easy for me at the moment because too many thoughts you know mixed up together so I would just start with the first thing I would appeal to all the climbers and the mountaineer mountaineering lovers for John Pablo John Snorri and Ali Sedpara that they deserve justice to be served and why I am saying that the only reason because of the news coming in because we just heard all of a sudden out of nowhere the news came in that the Nepalese authorities have cancelled the Indians uh, climbers claim of uh, conquering the Mount Everest um, <clears throat> which is a good thing if someone fakes anything well that person should be because sportsmanship right it's also a kind of sports it's it's an activity which which gives other people's kind of motivation so there should be no cheating in sports well that's my own point of view people could agree to disagree with that but sportsmanship but the timings of this news was also very strange and uh, they canceled the, uh, the, 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 the 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 summit um, claim of the Indian Indian climbers which would be really upsetting for them as well, well I don't know and uh, not only that this this they brought out a case back in 2017 it's uh, 13 I think they, this, that that couple the Indian couple a police officer and his wife they also claimed and then that was also circulating among the media so you know that clicks any layman's brain right away so, hmm, okay so how was it fake it was fake because the pictures they showed they were fake the videos they made were you know pro uh, they were um not the real videos they were edited they were used in a kind of you know video software or application or whatever you call it so on the basis of that and the color of clothes once they were climbing, they had different sets of clothes. I mean, that would be stupid. I mean, if you want to do something else, you have to watch the movie, uh, the, 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 the TV serial, How to Get Away with a Murder. <laughs> I recommend them that next time when they try this kind of shit, you know. They should at least match the things. You're wearing yellow once you're going up. And once you reach the summit, you turn into orange. I mean, your suit. So, no, no. That was very obvious. Now, the same thing I want to apply here on um, the Nepalese who claimed on the 16th of January once they reached to the base camp they claimed at that time that they have done the summit they have only one video to show and that video is has been I will use the same graphics using this room to show the same effect okay without with this camera you can see the camera is, is right just taking my picture right away right there is no uh, video work involved so far, but I will change it to exactly the same curvature which they have used while being on top. So that means that their cameramen were of really, I mean, they were professionals. The cameraman who went with them is Jan um, Jan Chalswick or or Valschak. I will check the name later and I will tell you because his his statement is also very important. So anyhow, 
I was just checking the time. My video is already nine minutes and forty-two seconds, but I will go on no matter how long this video gets. I, I, because I'm not doing it for the for 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 the clicks or for the likes or for whatever it is. My channel is already <laughs> a piece of shit. So in fourteen years, if nothing has happened, so nothing is going to happen in the future as well. But the thing is that I need to bring this to the climbers association, to the climber community of the world, to justify the death of these three. I mean, it's not their job even, but people of Pakistan are curious to know what has happened there and all the stories not the rumors the stories which are confirmed by some of the people who were there and they were being on TV and they which I will come later in the later part of the video so <clears throat> that's what I'm saying my second appeal would be for the climbing associations, whatever there is in the market, whatever there is in the world. I have no idea about that. I told you that I, I have no idea about climbing. Although I live in China, where we have normally in winter, in January and in February, we have the temperatures of about uh, 30 degrees, minus 30, below zero Celsius. Okay. Um, this year we had the, the, the coldest winter, so I can... I can think about the difficult, but again, minus 40, minus 50, minus 60, and sometimes minus 80 on K2. That's beyond my comprehension because in minus 30 over here, and we are living above like 50 meters above the sea level. We are not at a very high location in China at the moment. It's 50 meters above the sea level. And once we go out, I mean, I'm telling you, if I pee outside, it, within seconds it gets frozen so in minus 80 i could see that people are peeing then the, the pee is frozen right away like i mean i don't want to go into those kind of examples as well so again on the basis of the indian fake conquest of mount everest the climber association has to ask the Nepalese, again, I have already given them my congratulations and my heartiest congratulations to the, for them to achieve that task. It's not an easy task. And they have done it. But lots of links are missing. They have done the summit. They should have pronounced it from the top. They had the satellite phones. They had everything. They should have called the base camp and told their people, you, we did the summit. Because I have flown to 36,000 feet, which is about 12,000 meters uh, by myself, solo. And when we were solo and done a lot of maneuvering um, on top. So I know the feelings of this kind of, you, the first thing you want to do is you want to tell someone that you have achieved that task. But... They waited. They didn't tell anyone on C4 or C3 or C2 or C1 or even the ABC, the advanced base camp, but they told, broke the news to the world on 16th of January at the base camp. And then only one video, which is, I'm sure, even, you know, I don't have any experience in video editing as well, but I can, I can tell you that that video is also, it, there, 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 there has been a work done on that one. I'm, not accusing anyone and if someone thinks that I'm accusing bring up the evidence because I will make this video the same curvature later and I will show you so I have the master video which is right now you're watching and I, I will change it to some other effects because there are lots of apps uh, found on internet and you can you can choose the effects but anyhow what beat me I mean I'm a liar. I, I am just trying to, you know, using it as a clickbait and then I'm just trying to get more viewership and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, shut my mouth up by bringing the real video. So that's my <clears throat> uh, first concern and appeal to the Climbing Association. I'm, I don't know that I, whether I'm using the, same, the right name or not, but this is just coming out of me by itself. I'm not using any notes, nothing, nothing is around me. So I want the Climbing Association to come into it and ask them to bring the proper evidence of their summit of the Nepalians, apart from that video. That video, if they have a real one, like this one, they should bring it up. That would, that would 
because for me, I know that every 1,000 feet, if you go above sea level, there is a difference of minus two degrees and there is a drop of pressure because we have been flying. So we know what happens once you go up, right? So, so anyhow, there's also another, again, it's not the rumors because as I said, that there are many conspiracy theories about that, and I am not picking any of the conspiracy theories which are just trying to, you know, make yourself famous or whatever, you know. I am not trying to do that. So I would quote the people who were there and who have the testimonies recorded in on the TV channels and some newspapers. The first we start with, you know, with that I have written the notes down. Uh, not the note, it's another phone of mine where I'm just keeping the notes just to uh to be on the right track so now the reasons why i am asking the mountaineering association or the climbing association or the lovers of mountaineering or lovers of climbing these high mountains because i can never do that you people have done it so i would give you my salute reason number one is there was an incident on january 13th because these people the nepalese they came out of nowhere they said that they have acclimated in mount everest and they just flew in and ali said para johnson Ari, their team along with Sajid said para there were three in their team arranged by the jasmine tourist company of pakistan and uh, they the jasmine tourist company of pakistan claims that they have given them enough oxygen they have given them enough food they have given them enough tents whatever they have signed for on the contract with john snorri they have provided everything at the base camp and their porters took those things with the help of the the, the mountaineers uh, to the top of uh, not to the top of the mountain but to the to the last position which was c4 the camp four and camp three so the Pakistani tourist company claims that they have provided everything. And why would they not provide? I mean, it's the only thing because of the pandem pandemic, sorry, this coronavirus. It started in China, by the way. Because of that, already the tourism companies are suffering a lot. So there is no motive for Jasmine Tourist Company to not to give the foreign climbers what they wanted. That's where the the first statement by what's his face? Um, let me see, Mister Mister Ilya Sekli, right? The the Canadian photographer and the cameraman who went to record Ali Para's documentary, and that how he does that. You know, many people. It's also their passion and ambition to record such kind of things for their own pleasure and for their own. And they don't want any audience to credit them for that and I totally understand so his statement was that they also ordered a few cylinders of uh, oxygen uh, and uh, once they reached to camp three the oxygen was not where it was supposed to be so it was supposed to be at camp three so it was not there so I don't know what he meant by that maybe some guy who, who can speak English very well can can make me understand but let's stop over here the oxygen was missing second thing that uh, the tents there were only three tents and taken by surprise or oh, for that I have a reference uh, uh, just let me roll over quickly uh, it's uh, winter kid who wraps up with uh, many unanswered questions. That's the topic of that article written in the newspaper. And it, he said the only confirmed ten tents at Camp 3 that night were those carried by three climbers, Sai Satpara, to share with his father and John Snorri. And then later on, three tents, three people. Totally makes sense, right? Because the fourth one, uh, uh, Juan Pablo or John pa Pablo in, in uh, English, Juan Pablo, John Pablo, uh, they were not part of Ali Sadpara's team. They were the part of the other, the Seven Summit Trek, the Nepalese uh, tourist agency, which brought these uh, Nepalese Sherpas and uh, the, the other climber who, who claimed the summit to K2 in winter. So when the weather window was cleared on 5th of February, I mean, before that, in, in advance, you could notice modern technology, so they tried, they sent all the people up 
two came three and there were only three tents. What happened to all the other tents? Definitely the Nepalese came down. They also had the tents there and they were not that you know stingy or in need of money that they would pack those tents tents up and put them on their backs again and come down to base camp most of the time people just leave the things over there could be blown away by the wind but that's a huge coincidence because there are lots of coincidences which people cannot answer only a professional mountaineer or a climber can answer those questions which rises in the minds of common people like me so what happened to the tents there? What happened to the oxygen cylinders? Nothing was there. And that was the time when... So, anyhow, that's my first appeal because of these reasons. They need to prove, they need to come up, the Nepalese have to come up with a proper video of their summit. And these tents, these oxygen cylinders were missing, definitely. And then, obviously, John Snowy and... Um, uh, uh, what you call uh, Ali Sadpara and uh, Sajid Sadpara, they brought those 30 people into their tents. So in one tent, they say, uh, they claimed that there were four tents, three taken by Ali Sadpara's team and one was already there. So four tents, 30 people, on the average, seven people are, were one in one tent. They couldn't even sit properly, they couldn't light on properly. And temperatures were on minus 40 at that height. And... There were lots of problems, I mean, which... Now, the question comes, when the earlier Sherpas from Nepal, once they did the summit, on their way back, where did, where did their tents go? Well, we're not talking about the oxygen center, they might have used it, although they claim that, that the guy, one of the guys did it without the oxygen. And that, in, even in the same video, that guy is seen with an oxygen mask. So that's another lie. But anyhow, we'll come up to that later. So right now, what I'm, what I'm saying is, tents were missing, oxygen cylinders were missing. It's not the job of the tourist company though, but who sent so many people up there? And all of a sudden, all those people just said, no, we aren't gonna go to the, we, we, we are not gonna go for the summit. We're just gonna go back, including the, 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 the cameraman of uh, Ali Sadpara and uh, John Snorri, uh, Mr. Ilya Sikeli, he also left with his team. Once they were going down, now, I have to stop here and try to explain the case that from ABC, from the advanced base camp, 5,300 feet, to uh, 7,300 camp three, the installment of ropes was the duty of Mr. Ali Sadpara and uh, John Snorri's team. There were only three members in that one, which was uh, Sadpara, two Sadparas, the father and the son, and John Snorri, these three. Uh, uh, Juan Pablo, he joined up later. He was not on under the Jasmine Tourist Company's uh, uh, tour. He was under the Seven Summit track. And uh, it says uh, Tamara Langer, Colin O'Brady and J.P. Moore. They were the ones who were the first ones to reach on the night of February 3rd or 4th. So once they reached there, then they... Uh, Ali Sadpara at that time gave shelter to all the people. It was minus 40. Come on, man. Where are they going to stay? And they put them in their tents. So everyone was having seven to eight people in one tent. So J.P. Moore, when when he, he, he saw that yeah, these people have potentials to go up, so why not? His name will all, because he's not a professional climber, as per said by the other climber uh, climbers of that same group. He was a kind of um, entertainment. Just it it was people do crazy things for no reasons. So I can totally understand that. So he went up with them. So now there are four: two Sadparas, Snowy, and uh, Pablo. They went up uh, from 7, 7, 7,300 feet to the, the, the top. So the four were left and all other 26 people, they came down. Now for coming down, all the ropes were installed by the Nepalese, by the Nepalese Sherpas. And uh, what's his face? The guy, because I'm not good at Bulgarian names. Uh, yes, Atanas Skatov. 
pardon me if I'm pronouncing the name wrong, but it's it's it's, it's in English. So Atanaskatov, A T A N A S S K A T O V. That person, he was being filmed by a Napoli Sherpa. And the Napoli Sherpa said that he moved the camera there and he moved the camera back. And when he moved the camera back there, the guy was gone. The Bulgarian uh, uh, climber. Gone. And uh, Ilya Sekli saw him with his own eyes that he was tumbling down, almost hit his partner on the right side. And uh, the, 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 the stone even had a hole in, uh, in Ilya's uh, helmet. And the guy, they saw the guy rolling down all the way to the, near, next to the base camp. And the person just died. He was on a wrong rope. And especially, I mean, there are lots of questions here. What ropes were they? So again, that's a professional climber who can answer those questions. But I'm assuming that because he was right on top of Elia. So Elia used the, because he was under under him. So Elia used, or Elia, he used the rope first. He was pretty much secure on that rope. Well, unless there are hundreds of ropes there, which is, again, in my later part, it would be denied that there, there's no way that there were lots of ropes hanging at the same time and he used the wrong one and he dropped off and his Sherpa, his the other Nepalese uh, porter or helper, nothing happened to him, but this guy, he died. So that's a big question over here. But anyhow, those ropes were not installed by Sherpa's team, they were installed by the Napoleon's team, for sure. And one person died, others didn't. So it's one out of, 20, 26, so, which is a good ratio. But again, why? Why even one died and no one could record? Question mark. So from 7,300, again, we'll have to switch back to January 13th because Odyssey Para's team and John Snorri's team were there from December 5th onwards and they were trying to acclimate, you know, you know not I, that mountaineers and the climbers have to go up and down up and down to get their lungs used to it so once you go up the air pressure is lower the temperature is lower so the oxygen the amount of oxygen you can get into the lungs is also lower because your lungs shrink yeah once you go deep into the ocean for deep sea diving those deep sea divers must know that your lungs expand once they're under high high pressure, if the, the capacity of your lungs is like six gallons uh, per, per lung, which is normal on, on above ground level, but once you go into the sea, it expands. Uh, once I went for scuba diving, I was I was told, especially by the, 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 the instructors, that once you go down, it's a tendency, the tendency of a normal human being to try to hold up the air into your lungs and because once you're holding it in, you are floating, you start to float it, you come up quickly. And they said, never ever do that. And we asked the question, why? He said, but what, within, within when, once you're going uh, away from uh, the, 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 the sea level, uh, because of the pressure increasing, because of uh, temperature increasing, your lungs expand. And if they have normal capacity of six uh, gallons of air, it, it could be doubled at 10 meters or yeah 10 meters of depth it could be doubled so once your lungs are holding 10 gallons and the capacity of six gallons because lungs are like sponge but once you come up holding that 10 gallons in your lungs which have six gallons capacity now your lungs could puncture so same happens once you go to the height your lungs they contract so your capacity of oxygen into your lungs is lower. So for that, you need the oxygen to get your blood pumped and you know, your pulmonary veins and they, they should be just functioning very well. So th th that was just a, an issue that I do understand that what happens, so why you have to acclimate on, uh, on, uh, on climbing these mountains. So 5th of January, Ali Sabra's team is already there trying to acclimate with the situation, with the surroundings, the atmosphere of K2. 
and uh, the Napoleons, they just barge in. And definitely, of course, Winter Summit is a challenge for everyone. And uh, so everyone wants to be the first. And the Nepalese, they found a window and it, it said that Ali Sadpara came in and uh, he's resolved that because Johnson already wanted to go up first because they were there first. So it's their right to use a veil, that that weather window. But Ali Sadpara came in between, negotiated, and he said, okay, we have another window coming up in uh, February 3rd, 4th, and 5th. So we will use that window because we're still not acclimated to Camp 4 and the bottleneck and whatnot, you know. Well, th that's the story told by the owner of the Jasmine um, uh, Tourist Company of Pakistan uh, because he, he, they were in touch with each other and definitely Ali Sadpara would be a best climber but um, he may not have the best English skills to communicate with John Snorri so sometimes the translation happens through the owner of the Jasmine Tourist Company so you know this all makes sense that this story is said by the owner of the Jasmine Tourist Company that this has happened on January 13th. This dispute, this argument, and that's where the things come up. That's where the, the other Bulgarian uh, uh, climber who was there with those Napoleons and she gave an interview to uh, Polestar TV of uh, Bulgaria. And she claimed in her fifth minute, fifth, five minutes and 55 seconds, she claimed that Nepalese threatened that do not follow us. Because the window is open, three days windows, 13th, 14th and 15th of January. They could, anyone could go up and it takes like what, 36 hours uh, for uh, 24 to 36 hours for coming up and, going, uh, and coming down. So on the average, it would be 12 to 18 hours. Now we're talking about C3, Camp 3, to the top and to the summit and summit back to C3. 24 to 36 hours. Meet me on that one. If I'm wrong, please correct me. That means the one, one way trip would be 12 hours because that calculation is very important because I'm going to use it later. My video is 32 minutes long. I don't care about that at the moment. So this quarrel has happened. They have threatened to cut the ropes, confirmed by the Bulgarian female uh, climber on her TV. And the statement of the, the Nepali team leader himself in his newspaper, which I've just checked, it's called Online Khabar, which is Online Khabar means online news. Nepalese on K2 climber narrates. What does he narrate? He narrates, the international media and the mountaineering community were calling us a weak team. Now, it hit them because they are the owner of the highest mountain in the world, says Mingma Ji. Mingma Ji, that's his name. Only me and my team know how much effort we put into this expedition. There was no chance we were going to let anyone else beat us to the top. So, the rivalry already came out and previous year uh, to 2019 John Snorri and uh, these same Nepalese they were there and they had a dispute as well which is well recorded so they had a problem with each other and eventually Ali Sadpara negotiated and just asked them okay so we have from ABC to Camp 3 we have installed the ropes which you have used to come up so you are going up wish you good luck do it first we don't care, go, but do us a favor. What? Install the ropes, which they were eventually gonna do it because they have to you, to go up the, some, no, that's the tricky part. They had to do it because they were going up, so they would install the ropes for going up and for coming down. But even then, Bali Sadpara asked them, and they, and again, the confirmation is with the owner of Jasmine Tourist Company, the person he has already said that this was the deal okay you go first and keep the ropes and tell us the path you have chosen to go up so that we should follow the same one and once the weather is clear in the future we will use the same you are the first one to be Ali Sadpara was that because you know a, a, a person who is I would say the son of mountains his heart is bigger than the mountains so 
said, go ahead. Still, my country's uh, pride, even if you if you do the summit. So see, well, again, he's an unsung hero. We never knew about him. I have known about his stories uh, from different uh, bloggers and vloggers. I've checked all, the, all, all of their histories and he was a well-known man among communi climbers community. So hats off. And to John Snorri as well, because he's also very well known among the climbers community. So they took the ropes and uh, they went for the summit. Now, that's where the international community has to come up. That's why I'm keeping my this vlog in English, because I don't speak Bulgarian. I don't speak the language in, spoken in Iceland or Bulgaria or Chile. Uh, I don't even speak, speak the language of Alisa Para because they have a local dialect. So I, I can't even speak that one. So I'm just, and if I make it in Urdu, if you see my gardening channel, it's in Urdu in my, in my national language. But I'm doing this in, in English so that English is a universal language so that everyone, I'm trying to be, because again, English is not my mother tongue as well. So there will be lots of mistakes. So please pardon me on that one. But I'm trying to convey the message in a universal language so that people should give me a feedback and give all the people of Pakistan give a feedback so that and people in Iceland, people in Chile, because they deserve to know what happened to their climbers. So the question comes, did the Nepalese install the ropes? If they haven't gone up to the summit, if they haven't done the summit, there would be no ropes there. None. Not for going up, not for coming down. That's, I think, every climber would agree with me on that. That if they didn't do the summit, there there won't be any ropes there, which, which would be checked later in the summertime or close to the summertime. I'm sure that Sajid Satpara, the son of uh, Ali Satpara, would go there to find what has happened to his dad because his dad was he has done eight of the eight thousand meter high mountains in the world i think he's the only one if, if i'm if i'm wrong again correct me but that's what we are told so if there was no rope from c3 to the bottleneck and from bottleneck to the summit and there were if there were no ropes from coming down as well if there are different ropes used the question mark comes on napoleon summit for that, they have to come up with a video proof. Because if their cameraman is that good that he used that, that, that the curvature on the camera's lens and he's using that kind of video and uh, he made such a great video, which is, by the way, I mean, on top of 8,611 meters, no wind was blowing. It was, there was no wind at all. And the guy who they claim did it without oxygen clearly can be seen was wearing an oxygen mask. Two questions. There Sherpa on the way back from C3 with Ilya Scaly coming down recorded everything. And that was a Nepali, Nepalian uh, uh, climber, porter. He recorded everything, but he couldn't record the death of uh, the Bulgarian uh, climber, unfortunate death of, uh, of him. So the guy, Jan uh, Valzak, is a professional cameraman. He must have better skills and better videos than the than, than, than Napoleon Sherpa. So there should be a video evidence. How much time did it take from C3 to bottleneck, C4, from C4 to bottleneck, from bottleneck to the top, from the top back to bottleneck, or from bottleneck to C4, and from C4 to C3? The time doesn't match. You can check it up, because I am not an expert. I am not a climber. I've never done that. I've just, just done hiking. So, that's another question that the times don't match. They don't have any video apart from the singing national anthem of Nepal, 
That's the only evidence they have provided. And they did the summit. They didn't tell it to anyone at the summit, at Camp 4, at Camp 3, Camp 2, Camp 1. And they told everyone at the base camp. I mean, they could, eight people could keep the, the, the world record. K2 has never been conquered in winter. And they were the first ones. They did it. They, 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 they told no one. And again, the, oh. so now let's come to the last part because the video is 40 minutes long already. I will cut it in two parts, I think. The last part I would try to say now. Ilya Skelly has his vlog recorded on his uh, on his website uh, where where he mentions that he heard two calls by 11 o'clock on the night of 4th and 5th between 4th and 5th uh, uh, he switched his uh, uh, walkie talkie off the, the wireless set off at about 11 o'clock before sleeping because it was too cold and there were like seven people in one tent imagine like like sardan he <laughs> the fish you know like on top of each other imagine that and uh, of course everyone was uneasy and uncomfortable so he switched it off because next morning they had to go down they aborted the mission they didn't want to shoot anymore they wanted to come back along with all those 30 people or 26 by that time came back only Juan Pablo volunteered to go with Ali Satpara and Sajid Satpara and John Snorri and rest of the 26 people came down one of them unfortunately died on the way down the one call was that and the second call was again from the top no tents are there holy fuck no oxygen is here so people who were who went on top because John Snorri and Alisa Parra and Sai Parra and John Pablo they decided to move up to camp four and they found out that there were no tents and oxygen even there so where did everything go that's a big question mark was it thrown away by the previous people over there or blown away by the wind again a question to be answered is it possible for wind to i mean everything is possible in this world but these all these coincidences and all the improbabilities or the things most unlikely to happen were happening at the same time on the same night at that k2 winter summit which was threatened by the previous um, conquest winners so i don't see it's a coincidence so he had heard these two calls, and the, and the final call he heard was, oh fuck, what's he doing? He's going to kill himself. That couldn't be Ali, Ali Sapara or Sadi Sapara because they don't use, they, their English is not that advanced that they should use the F words. So it must be either John Snorri or Mr. Uh, Juan Pablo, John Pablo. It could be either of them. Now, who, if it was John Snorri, who was he talking about? Would he be talking about uh, Pablo? Pablo was just a, he was doing it for entertainment. He was not a professional climber. So there's no way that he would have taken an initiative that if conditions were unfavorable, he would have said no, no. If professionals are saying we can't go up, we are not going up. So. Either Ali Sadpara took initiative and went up. Now, why would he risk the other two and along with his son? So my best guess is that it was the call, uh, uh, the one who said that he's going to kill himself. It must be uh, John Snorri. Oh, sorry, John Pablo. He would have said those words. Why? obviously. John Snorri had a tussle with the Napoleons and Napoleons took initiative even from coming later to Camp 3 and they went to the summit first and even it was the right of John Snorri so he wanted to get that title back from them so no matter the rope was not there oxygen they had uh, well they didn't lack oxygen by the way because the owner of the Jasmine 
tourist company says that they had everything in full. So the only thing left is that they didn't have the ropes from 7,300 meter and above. And if there are no ropes and you try to continue, definitely people will say, oh, he's crazy. He's gonna kill himself. What the fuck is wrong with him? So definitely that was John Snorri's decision because he was a team leader. And I assume that there were no ropes. Now let's, that becomes a conspiracy theory. And again, I'm saying that it's not because of any conspiracy or clickbait. So we move on. Let's say the ropes were there. Once they reached uh, Camp 4 at 7 o'clock in the morning, John Snorri calls his wife and he says, Darling, we have made it to Camp 4 and these are the conditions. I'm not feeling well. I have a few frostbites and we look pretty lively and uh, we are going to do it. We will do it today or later on or whenever the, the time comes. So from 10 o'clock, no, 7 o'clock, he makes the last call and then they started their final climb. And they reached up to 8,200 meters by 10 o'clock. Sajid Satpara, his oxygen regulator got problem. His father had his one. He gave him that one. He tried to fix that one on the cylinder and boom, that started to leak as well. And he was already having this confused state of mind. So... Sajid Para asked, Ali Sajid Para asked his son to abort, go back. And Ali Sajid Para, Sajid Sajid Para had no other option because he doesn't have any oxygen. And Juan Pablo also didn't have any oxygen. So, but he continued. But Sajid Sajid Para, because he already got this high sickness, so he had to go back. He went back by so at 10 o'clock in the morning they were at the bottleneck now and Sai Sipara started to come back so he says from bottleneck to camp four we took him two to three hours i don't know again the time of how, how long does it take i know from camp three to summit and summit to back is 24 to 36 hours so from camp three to the top it takes 12 hours to be on top and then 12 hours, kind of, if you were faster, like 100 meters per hour. So that's what the speed is normally. So the thing is, if he he comes back by 12 o'clock and she looks back from camp four to bottleneck and he can still see those three climbing up. And he claims that they were in pretty good condition. So 8,200 meters, Mr. Uh, Sajid Sapara comes down, so definitely they made it to 8,200 meters. They did it, that's for sure. Sai Sapara is there to be the witness. And they come back, uh, he comes back. And by 12 o'clock, that means in two hours, they must have gone over the bottleneck, which he claims that yes, they were over the bottleneck. Now, climbers would tell me or tell us that is it possible for anyone to see at the top of the bottleneck from C4? So I have no idea about that one. I can even get, get a big guess. That's why my appeal to the climbers to answer these questions so that everything gets cleared. You know, we just, the people are gone. They cannot come back. But we just want to know that we should give them the proper, you know, farewell. The proper farewell is that we know what happened to them. We should know. That's our right. So... Bottleneck's top is 8,400 around around that. So 211 meters left. And by 12 o'clock, they were around the bottleneck. Ropes are there or ropes are not there. We don't know. If ropes are there, it would be easier for them to go up. If ropes are not there, it would be a bit difficult for them because they have to, you know, install every rope on every step of the way, every inch of the way. So... Journey started at 10 o'clock. Uh, sorry, 7 o'clock in the morning. They started going up. And the last attempt, and then there was no radio signals. Um, they had no contact with it, with them. And uh, John Snorri's wife's claim is that the 
the Thraya satellite phone, it recorded 7,811 meters. It's on her Twitter. So uh, the minimum, they, they were at 7,811 meters by seven o'clock in the morning. And after that, maybe they turned off the satellite phone or it didn't work or whatever has happened. It got frozen, battery drained out, or they turned it off to use it later, which is more likely to be happening or to uh, has happened actually, because 7 p.m. after 12 hours, there was an attempt from John Snorri's phone to his wife's phone, which couldn't be connected, but there was an activity that the phone tried to call the other phone couldn't get connected because of various reasons. Because UAE Thraya, Thraya company, they say that John Snorri was using a cheaper set which cannot be located if it's off. And also the communication would not be as good as the one which mostly the, the, the rich climbers use, you know, for this kind of expeditions. So there were two varieties of Thraya phones. So he was using the second variety, which is less cheap, which is much cheaper than the first one. The first one, if, even if the battery drains out or nothing is working, it's still, it's still traceable. So in this case, it's a dead end, but it was used at 7 p.m. Exactly 12 hours after they started from C, C4 or C, yeah, C4, they were at C4. Did they make it to the top? The evidence suggests Yes. If there were no ropes, the only thing the police can deny about their summit is that, huh, there were no ropes. The ropes got blown away. How do you know? No, we installed the ropes. Then, professionals like Ari Satpara, who has climbed eight mountains, it would be a piece of cake for him to go up, along with uh, the frostbited uh, John Snowy and uh, the, 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 the non-professional climber, uh, Pablo, uh, Juan Pablo, may their souls rest in peace. So the summit was done, uh, allegedly again, because I'm not an authority to claim that one. On the way back, just like what happened to the Bulgarian uh, unfortunate climber, the rope broke. Or there was no rope for, uh, uh, rope for coming down. And that was the time. After 7 o'clock, the wind started blowing and the weather started getting uh, worse and worse. That's recorded on the, the, on the, the Met Department. And eventually, in the end, something happened, which we still don't know. So the only evidence we have, we are left with, is the Nepalese bringing up the videos of their climb up from bottleneck to the top of at least one video that they are putting the ropes on. And that video should be probed, should be checked, forensic should be done of that video. And also the top video, if they have this curvature side of thingy, definitely they have the original video of that one. They should bring it up so that Peace should be served to the souls of John Sonori, John Pablo, and Alisa Para. That's the that's the voice of everyone who belongs to their families, especially those people. They need to know that they died. Their death was not in vain. I believe personally, they have done the summit. Something happened on the way back. Mr. Uh, Nazir Sabir, a Pakistani ex-porter plus the, the mountaineer, he claims the same thing. Sajid Sapara, the one who's saying that he has seen them in a condition that they were very well set and they were going up. He claims the same thing. What about the other mountaineering world? What do they think? because I don't see, see much um, efforts, opinions into this case. It's not about winning. It's not about getting to the summit. We as Pakistanis, we didn't even know how many people have conquered this mountain. At least I didn't know. So it doesn't matter at all. 
But for a mountaineer, for a climber, I think it's the biggest pride. He's dead. They are dead. They don't know whether they... They know that they did it or not. But in order to satisfy the nations, people waiting for them, I think it's it's their right. It's their family's right that they did it. Because right now, under any circumstances, all the evidence we have, they did it. They have done it. Something happened to them on the way down. And that could only be known by if we probe the Nepalese. So that's all from my side. My video is already 55 minutes long. Although it's very long, I'm, not, I'm sure it's, it's gonna be very boring. Hopefully to get some answers from someone around. Salute to Alisa Para. Salute to John Snorri and to John Pablo and to Antennas. Goodbye.